do the right terms. And I think we're going to look at a little exercise here just to illustrate what we'll be looking for from you in your groups. So here we've got an example of a very old-fashioned uh, two-hole punch. So this is for simply punching holes in a piece of paper. This one's all made of sheet metal. So these are formed from sheet metal parts. Here's the handle. This is just a metal bar, metal side plate, riveted to a metal base, which also has a metal cover that you can unclip and take the parts out. So very simple. Spring here to offer resistance to the load and punching, and these come down and punch through the two holes. A very simple device, but quite old fashioned in its design. So that's deliberate, so you can see how we can improve it. So what we're trying to do is to say, given the set amount of data, uh, let's determine the appropriate assembly method for this particular punch. So we've got to try and decide what method we would use to make this particular device. We also want to try and design the design efficiency of this current design. And then we want to try and propose a design change and re-estimate the design efficiency. Just as we saw with our previous notes. So we're applying it to this rather old-fashioned design here. <coughs> okay. So what we need first of all is our data to determine what our investment factor is and what our business approach is going to be. First of all, we've got to determine how many shifts we're going to work. Are we going to work an eight hour day, or two eight hours in the day, or three? What's, going to, what's it going to be for our business? And then the important thing about what's the capital equivalent to replace one operator? In this case, we're saying I'm going to invest 30,000, which is, isn't double the cost of employing one person. Yeah, it's just a little bit more. So that's our policy. So our investment factor when you work about using this data is 1.2. That's what our business can live with. That's what we're prepared to try and do. So that's what you've got to do in each of your groups. Decide what your business is going to want to do in your particular case. I'm hoping that will vary from one group to another, depending on what you assume. We also need an anticipated production quantity Per shift. So in this business, we are saying we're looking at the market. We think we can make 25,000 a year. So it's not a huge number. Yeah, it's not a huge number that we're going to produce. But we think that that's what we can put into the marketplace and sell. The number of parts of one assembly, but believe it or not, in that particular current design, there are 19 separate components. 19 making up that one assembly. It's hard to believe when you first look at it, but when you go through the individual parts, 19. The number of design changes, well, we don't think there are very many, we're going to keep that to a very small number each year. Number of parts required in the model range, so again, very small, very little change there, and very little demand over the lifetime. So it's a fairly, what we call a conceptual static product. It's not going to change dramatically. We're going to stick with this particular design for the foreseeable future. So when we go through the processes using the, the Broodroy Dewhurst approach, once we've got an investment factor and we go through our table, then not surprisingly, it's telling us that we're somewhere between the manual assisted or the manual method when we put this product together. That's what it's suggesting, giving a low production quantity and the number of parts and the approach and the investment policy that we have. So it's going to be a manual assembly. So that's what we are deciding that we're going to go for for this particular design. You have to do the same thing for your particular design. Okay, so we'll start with that. Now comes the slightly more tricky bit. This is the table that we're going to use to estimate or work out the efficiency of the design as it currently stands. You can see here we've got the part number. Now it's shown 1 to 11. I said there was 19 parts in the design, didn't I? But of course some of them are the same. For example, we've got four rivets, I think. They're the same sorts of rivets, but we need four of them. So there are only actually 11 different parts. But we need to know what the total number of parts is. So 
11 different parks. This is the number of times that they are, these parks are used in the assembly. For example, we've got two of this component, which is a side plate. We've got two punches, we've got two springs, we've got two washers, and we've got four rivets. And finally, we've got two screws to screw the part together. So that total number of parts is 19, but there's 11 different parts. You see the difference between that? Good. So the first thing you have to do is to think about the manual handling time, the manual insertion time, and the overall operating time. You can see here, that's the addition of those two times. So 1.13, 1.5, 2.63. It's the total operating time for that one component. And this is for manual assembly. Now you get these times by just simply working through the existing product and saying how much time does it take to pick this up, get it in the right operation, and insert it. And getting somebody to actually time that operation. That's how you do it. Repeat it a few times, average them, and you'll get an idea of how long it's going to take to manually assemble your product. Okay? Very simple. But it gives you a basis on which to compare your design. So we've got our operating time. We can also here include our operating cost. Now, we're working on the basis here that assembly costs 0.4 pence per second for manual assembly. That's how much it works out for us to do this, 0.4 pence per second. You can use that for your product if you want. Or if you think it's going to be assembled in a developing country where the wage levels are different, then you might reduce that from 0.4, maybe to 0.2 or whatever is appropriate. But you're giving yourself a basis to work out the cost as well as the time to operate this particular device, or to assemble this device. Okay? So once we've gone through that, we can add up our total operating time. In this case, it's 134.12 seconds, very precise. So that's our total assembly time for this existing product, TM. This is our total operating cost, we've added up all the costs here. It's about 54 pence in this case. Now, this is a little bit more tricky. This is a theoretical minimum number of parts. This is where you have to stop and think and say, can I imagine a way of eliminating any of these components and still have a functioning device? So the designers looking at this, they thought they could actually get rid of the side plates, maybe perhaps by combining them onto the base cover. Maybe. You could also get rid of the washers. You could think about getting rid of a cross plate. And you could get rid of the rivets. Now you can see that they might be able to get rid of the rivets by making the side plates part of some of the other part of the product. So they don't have to physically connect them together. So that was their best thought. And they thought the minimum number of parts they could have was seven. So we're starting from 19. And we're suggesting that given the best circumstances, we could reduce that to seven. So that's our theoretical ideal target. So let's go through that. We can then work out our design efficiency. So we've got our three seconds target times our theoretical minimum number of parts, which was NM. So that's three times seven, 21. And we're dividing that by TM, because that's our total manual time for our existing design. So we've 21 divided by 134 approximately. Our design efficiency, 0.15 or 15%. So that's telling us that this design, the current design of this product, we judge, is only 15% efficient. So if we want to improve it, we've got to prepare and produce a design that's going to be better than 15% efficient. We might give ourselves a target. We might say, okay, let's try and make it 30% efficient and try and work towards that. Or we just try and improve the design and then see what the efficiency comes out to be. But we expect this table for each group. You have to have an equivalent.
equivalent of this table for both the existing design of Akihela so that they can compare that with their proposed design. And that's where you're going to find out if your ideas that you've come up with, if you think are better than the Akihela, whether they actually are. And you might be surprised. What are you going to do if when you look at your design, you find that the efficiency is actually lower than the, the existing design? Hopefully what you're going to do is to start redesigning your product and refining it and making it even better. Yeah? But that's the whole purpose of doing this, is to get that process so that you're thinking about improving the efficiency and refining your design and getting it the best it can be, given all the pressures and all the constraints on it. So, that table has to exist. And we also have to have the re-evaluation of the efficiency. And here it is here. So you can see that what we've done is that we've eliminated parts three, parts six, seven, eight, so parts six and seven and eight. We've got one, two, four, five, nine, ten, and eleven. And eight. Eight. Their complexity has increased. Yeah. Particularly the base cover, base plate, these things, the complexity may have increased as a result of making these changes. But let's work out and see what our design efficiency is going to be. So we've still got our times. It might be that some of these times change because of the, the geometries changed and we have to manipulate them, take more time to assemble it. We have to work that out. So let's imagine this all goes together. We get now total time of 66.6 seconds. The cost is reduced to 26.6. We've still got a theoretical minimum number of parts. And when we work out our efficiency, in this case it comes out to be 31% efficient. So by making these changes, by eliminating these parts, simplifying the design, at least from an assembly point of view, we may have increased our product cost point of view, but we've reduced the assembly cost we've increased the efficiency, we've doubled it, by making those changes. So this approach helps us to understand what works in terms of trying to improve our assembly efficiency and what doesn't. Yeah? And the more you learn that, the more you automatically start to design products from the very beginning that are easier to assemble. And so you become a better designer, better engineer, you become much more efficient at what you do as an individual. And it's only by using these approaches where you can start to see that you're actually achieving an improvement and you learn from that. Yeah. So please take the time to apply this correctly and to try and make it work in your group. And this goes for everybody in your group, although it's one person's responsibility to report all this, it's important everybody in the group appreciates and learns from this process. Okay, some further things that we've got to think about is handling difficulty. So there's a number of things that are going to make it difficult for a human operator to manipulate components. Obviously the size, if it's very small, it's going to be very difficult for it to pick up and to position. If it's very big, it might be very heavy, could be dangerous for them to try and lift it. Weight, fragility, could it be easily damaged during that process? Is it slippery? Yeah. Is it, could it drop out of the hands? A whole range of things that we need to think about. Do we need to use two hands? Do we need optical mag uh, magnification? Do we need some mechanical assistance to help to maneuver the parts? All of these things you've got to think about. Because all of that has to be included in your assembly process. So handling difficulty, you need to consider. So here are some examples of it, just to make the point. If it's very small, how difficult is it going to be to pick up? Particularly if you get tired, if you have a tendency to fall asleep, which you know all about, yeah? You know all about that, you're already experts in that, aren't you? The difficulty of staying awake when you're back actually doing a job can be very difficult, particularly if it's a very boring job, repetitive job. How do you manage to 
Stay alert. Or do you suddenly find that your concentration, your ability to deal with these things, slows down over time until you have another coffee, and then it boosts, and then it goes down again. Yeah, What's yeah, actually happening? Yeah, and are you taking that into account when you're designing things? Could be suddenly, or could be sharp. Yeah, you might damage yourself. Let's imagine it is, and you have to give the operator gloves to use to stop them damaging themselves. It then becomes even much more difficult to pick the small part up. You need to think about all of these issues in your detail of your design. Now this is one I alluded to earlier. Let's imagine we've got the manual process, and we've got components in it that we're feeding to the operator. How do we stop them all jamming and tangling up? For example, we've got springs. They're notorious for interlinking, and you have to spend time taking them apart before you put it in assembly. If you put various changes to the design, like having a variation in the spring pitch, you can make that more difficult for the parts then to try. A bit of thinking ahead can save a lot of bother on the assembly. You might also want to think about if you've got parts that can interlock because of the angle, you can change the design so that it's physically impossible for them to jam together. That can make the assembly process a lot more efficient than it otherwise would be. Yeah. Think about the detail of the parts that you're putting together. And there's a number of areas where we can start to alter the detailed design to try and make that process even more efficient. Now, this is bad enough for humans to disentangle all of these parts and to put them in assembly. It's almost impossible if you're a robot or if you're an automated system. How are you going to disentangle the spring? You won't even know whether it's entangled. But you need to think about how you get this detail right. How you deliver each component into the assembly process. The next thing comes up with aligning it. How do we make sure that we align these things accurately? How are we going to make it easy for the operator, or indeed the machine? So here we've got an example where we've got a spring, and we want it to fit into the middle here. And because of how we've got this detailed design, it can catch on the edges. Because we haven't thought about maybe putting a slight chamfer in here that will allow the spring to naturally find its way into the center. Now these are small details but there are things that can be easily missed unless you take the time to think about it. Yeah? Please make sure you do that. In your design, if you're not thinking about these things, this is marks disappearing by not getting this detail right. Excuse me. Here we see another one where the operator is trying to put this part with a, with a large uh, top to it, with a thin a spike, and it's trying to make that center of that hole. Now because of the height difference and the length of this, it becomes very difficult for the operator to do that. It might end up sitting like this, and then you've got to try and fiddle to get it out, or take it upside down, shake it, and try and get it back in. Very difficult for the operator. It might be very easy if this was done by a machine. For example, if that was, could be magnetized, and it had a, a, a rod with a magnet on it, then that could maybe fit in there quite easily, maybe. But for a human operator, it becomes extremely difficult, it becomes extremely uh, annoying trying to do this. So by perhaps making the part a little bit longer, it makes it easier for it to locate the hole whilst the operator can still trip it. Small things, but they can make a big difference to how quickly you can assemble and put this product together. We'll look out for this in the accurate when you look at the individual components and put it right back together again on Thursday. Look to see if these features are there, or if there are things that could be improved from that point of view. Again, think about the parts that can be self-located. Here we've got a washer, and we're trying to line it up with the hole, but if we have a recess, we just drop the washer into it, the job's done. But somebody has to think about this. Somebody has to think about the extra machinery to put that part in, put that recess in place, so that will happen naturally. 
others that were taking a spring. <coughs> maybe we can have a recess, maybe that's a little bit more tricky, by having something projecting a little bit, maybe it's easier to put it on. Think about that. Those of you who had an idea of having a magazine to try and have a spring and push the pellets up to the top of the, the activity one, you're maybe going to have to face with this particular detail point. How do you make sure that spring always locates and doesn't actually come out of the location? Okay, insertion issues. Are we going to have to use brute force to put the parts in place? Are we going to use fasteners? How are we going to do it? And how do we create the access for somebody to actually do that and to make it work every time? Only you can get that detail right. And I'll just show you a couple here. And this is perhaps one of the most important is access to things. You've got to think about the operator trying to fit the bolt, in this case, screw the car seat to the, or the aircraft seat to the floor. How do they do it? Are you making their life difficult? Time consuming, but it doesn't have to be. Can you make the access better? Mm. How can we eliminate secondary operations? How can we do everything in one go, at one time, to get the detail absolutely right? You can look at these at your leisure, they're all on Google. Can we eliminate secondary operations? So, we can conclude in this section saying that this brood drawing of UHAS approach provides, I think, a relatively quick way to evaluate the assembly of an engineering system. And this is an important tool for you to learn what works in terms of assembly and what doesn't. What's efficient, what leads to an efficient outcome, and what doesn't. Now, as I pointed out, this approach is essentially comparative. There's no absolute measure for the assembly efficiency only judge it by comparing it with an ideal. But it gives us a basis in which we can determine what the relative merits are of our particular designs. And it'll be interesting when your groups work out what the, the efficiency is of each of your design to compare it one with the other. To speak to your friends in another group and say, what's the efficiency of your assembly? And if they say, well in our case it's working out to be 35% and you're only 5%, they might be able to stop thinking. What's the difference here? Why is it more efficient in that case and you're not achieving that? Take the time to think about it. Okay? To compare it with your, your friends and your colleagues. So we've got the benefits of being able to do this and it's important that you produce this in your report and the person who's doing this justifies all the decisions that they've made in terms of the assembly how it links to the cost, and how it links to someone else doing the component detail, and how it links to the person doing the injection bolt tool design, and how it links to everybody else. <coughs> Nothing is in isolation 100%. So don't be a person in the group who thinks, yes, I can disappear to my room, I'll do the bit on the cost thing, and then I'll come back and I'll be it done. It won't work that way obvious to us marking it and your marks will descend accordingly. Is everybody getting the message with that? Okay, good. Okay, for this first part then, are there any, any questions that anybody has? Hopefully it's fairly straightforward. <coughs>